Hey everybody, welcome back. Hope you've had a great week. And yeah, would you believe it? I'm in a rush today again, so let's rip into it. Alrighty, yeah, testing first up, and then I'll uh, link into, I guess, the upcoming holiday update, because they are, there's a bit of crossover there. But yeah, first cab off the rank, we've completed the main test for the Stramic Speed Wet Conditions Lubricant, so I'll have a look at uh, quickly at those results as just a, a sort of prelude to when I can get to the full detail review. I need to conduct the single application longevity testing for the Stramic Speed Wet Lube, which is sort of part of that. And then do obviously all the, all the cost, cost to run modeling and so on to make up the full detail review. Um, for the single application longevity test, I'm going to be skipping straight to just the, I guess, the extreme conditions part uh, of that test because that's really what this lubricant is designed for and that's really what I want to see how it compares versus um, other products. So um, I'm going to be yeah, zooming onto that. I should be starting it this weekend. Um, just to reset the, the test machine for that one. This was the... <laughs> You'll see, I'll add a couple more picks in, but this was the longest machine reset post-domain test uh, on record. The the level of gunk and just the sort of the sticky wax um, from everywhere that had to be cleaned was uh, was next level. All right, let's have a look at the just yeah you know, quick quick view of the um, main test for ceramic speed wet conditions. All right, going to be skipping straight to the. Uh, block 4 which is the wet conditions or wet contamination block uh, in the main test because that's really what this product is uh, designed for and you know it's not a poor result outright uh, it's certainly not all singing or dancing and really I guess its key competitors are these ones coloured similarly green which are the wax drip lubricants I'm sort of calling this block for today's purposes I guess your tier 1 wax strip lubricants these are your typically more expensive sort of fancier uh, more refined uh, base wax strips and strength speed wet conditions really would have wanted to be sitting at the top of this you know wax strip block here as opposed to sitting at the bottom of that wax strip block it's ahead of say the likes of grax and smooth and squirt but it's uh it's not topping out this table here which is really where they would want to sit so, um, you yeah, know, moving on to the, I guess, the extreme conditions, the single application longevity test, that in some way will give us a, a bit of a cleaner result because all lubricants, by the time they hit block four, obviously they're bringing into this test block some associated wear that they're going to have from contamination they've gathered through the previous test blocks. So it's not a perfectly clean picture for wet conditions performance, but it's a very strong picture and, you know, what we see indicated here will typically play out very similarly in the extreme conditions single application longevity test so i'm not expecting that it's going to you know all of a sudden beat the competitors that it hasn't beaten here uh, it may improve um, we'll see by how much but i don't think it's going to sort of move up to the top which for a wet condition specific product that's really where you know, both myself and Stramic Speed would have wanted to see it. And flicking back to, a, I guess, just a couple of quick picks from the end of test. Um, yeah, we can see here it certainly makes your lower pulley wheel more aero, as I mentioned on the other week. Um, but it certainly doesn't make your cage more aero. Uh, I think I've got one more quick pick here as well. So there's just a whole lot of stuff. There was, um, yeah, build up galore pretty much everywhere. Now again, you know, it's very clear that this is not what this product is designed for with regards to just using this as your daily lube. It is a heavy application of the product each time, so you do get, you know, excess build up much more quickly. And it's really quite sticky and tacky, which is obviously part of its design brief to um, you know, not be washed off. So to, to give you that longevity and protection against wear out in the sort of harsh wet conditions. You know, the, the trade-off to that being a sticky tacky wax is that it's it's going to give you the most build-up. And yeah, we've really not seen any other product build up like this. Really probably the closest was Smooth. And in Ceramic Speed's own testing, Smooth was really the closest product to theirs in their own wet conditions testing. Right now, I'll just cover this point again, I guess, fairly quickly because I'll, I'll go into more depth in the detail review but you know it's it's just to me clearly a product that has some 
pretty big compromises with regards to its, I guess, use case. So because of the, the amount that it gunks up and that it is really not an easy clean because it is quite a tacky, sticky, um, you know, wax drip. So even though some, say for instance, wet lubricants do get quite dirty quite quickly uh, and can take a bunch of frequent maintenance to, uh, to try to keep those lubricants clean, the maintenance, if you're going to do it, is relatively easy. You blast some solvent or degreaser through, you can wipe it off and, uh, you know, pretty much away you go. You just can't do that with this product. It's sticky and tacky and it is not easy to get off your chain. It is not easy to get off uh, any of the parts of your drivetrain, like your derailleur cage and pulleys and cogs. It just smears um, and yeah, you just, it's a really tough clean. So, you know, if your plan was to use this as your daily lubricant and uh, that way, if you do get caught in the wet, you're covered, you're just in for, you know, a world of maintenance fun um, with that as your daily lubricant product. You can um, lessen the application amount versus the instructions, which will give you less build up less quickly, but it is still going to be really quite a bit and quite quickly versus pretty much any of the other products um, that you see on the on the test list that, that we put through the test. Um, I in in I guess for this the original test of this and this current one, I had discussed with Ceramic Speed with regards to the application amount because if, I, if you went with the full application amount that they they have on the instructions the amount of build up you would have would be you know quite mega in quite no time at all because it is a very heavy application so i was able to i guess halve that for the dry um, test blocks and then move to the full application recommendation uh, for the wet test blocks to give it the most protection but it's still yeah it's you know, obviously there's no cleaning through the main test, and so by the time we've got to do it at the end of the main test, it was it was nuts. It was like an hour and a half to uh, to clean up the machine. Um, yeah, it's just simply, it really to me limits this product in that you have to just have a chain if you're going to be using this uh, for wet conditions riding prepped for your wet conditions ride. So that's more or less like, okay, I'm planning to ride Thursday. It's looking like it's going to be wet Thursday. Let me grab my wet conditions specific chain prepped with ceramic speed wet conditions ready to rock in that. And then I'll worry about resetting the chain after that and prep it again ready for the next wet ride. It's just to me not feasible at all to use this as your daily training lubricant um, so that you're going to be okay should that day's riding turn out to be wet. And I guess the level, uh, you know, how many cyclists are at the level of having a separate chain that they're going to pre-prep for wet ride days, I just don't think it's very large. Um, so I, I don't know what the target demographic for this product really is overall. Uh, so it's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, really all, I guess, of the other products on that you know test so you know a couple of others that did quite well in the wet conditions so especially say true ten tension tungsten or weather that stays pretty clean for a long time so you know it, you, you can use a lot of the other products on the list there as your just your general daily lubricant and then if it happens to get um, you know caught in the wet unless that ride is really long and really harsh you're going to be okay so it's kind of up against it a little bit. It's going to really have to smash the um, the single application um, longevity test in the extreme conditions. Be perhaps a recommendation for if you've got a really long, harsh, wet event that maybe it's a great option for that. But yeah, at the moment, it's yeah. You know, sadly, as much as I love ceramic speed, uh, yeah, the the old conditions really is one of the all time greatest drip lubricant products out on the market. Um, this one is certainly not something that would be stocking and recommending at this time. Right, yeah, ongoing at the moment. So firstly, a huge thanks again to uh, customer and follower James, who uh, he dropped off his uh, Neo. So the uh, third test machine is back up and running with a brand new Tax Neo. Haven't had a chance yet to take the other one apart to see um, how, the, how the fire was inside, but I'll try to get to that uh, sometime. Uh, but yeah, so testing at the moment is, we're, we're all flat out. So that uh, machine will be uh, now using for the ceramic speed wet conditions, uh, the single application longevity test to finish that one off as um, 
I'm gonna try to keep that machine reserved for the public testing or the open testing. The other two test machines uh, were book solid for the foreseeable future with uh, private tests, a bunch of which I have to try to get done before uh, heading off to the USA um, holiday. So that's going to be keeping me pretty busy to try to get all of those done. So for the holidays, um, I'm, a few things I'm just going to, I guess, pre-alert. We may at some stage need to close the, I guess, the ZFC online store. Um, I'm going to be working as hard as I can to try to get as much stock in and prepped so that uh, my retail grand chancellor, Andrew, has sufficient stock to uh, to be able to fulfill orders whilst I'm away. But that's going to be a really big challenge. Apart from the challenge of getting enough uh, stock in, I also have to have the time to pre-prep all that stock. And we just have so many chain variations. may not seem like it, but there, if you look at all the different types of chains we sell and that they are offered in you know with either m speed wax prep or silka hot melt prep or uh, rex black diamond uh, four plus one prep or full race prep it's a huge number of chains to try to be on top of and yeah pretty much it's a challenge each week to keep up the number of uh, pre-preps to match the orders going out uh, me trying to get ahead on that in the lead up over basically the next uh one month that i have or four weeks that i have um to yeah, so that Andrew has stock for three weeks that I'm away. I'm not sure how well I'm going to succeed at that. So it could be that I, I managed to really get a, enough in and done and that Andrew's okay. It could be that we last two weeks out of the three weeks I'm away. It could be that we last one week. Um, and then, you know, there's only so many back orders we can sort of feasibly keep on top of. Uh, so if it gets a bit too crazy on that, where just really every order coming in, we're unlikely to be able to fill. Um, we'll just have to put the online store uh, on basically on standby for a couple of weeks and then reopen when, when I get back and get a bit caught up. So, so just in case if you're looking for a pre-prep chain, um, you know, coming up soon that doing that before I zoom off uh, on holidays will, you know, from an order fulfillment perspective, probably be a safer bet just in case we end up having to close the uh, the online store for a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm probably gonna be logging off from the, I guess the ZFC uh, inbox about a week prior, I think, so that I can do a big final push on uh, focusing on chain pre-preps and, uh, and wrapping up uh, testing that I really need to get done before I go. Um, and yeah, we'll see how we go. So we'll do our absolute best, but um, worst case, if we do close the ZFC online store for, I think it'd probably be a maximum of a couple of weeks. As soon as I'm back and recovered from whatever jet lag, I will be ripping back into the ultrasonics and the wax pots and we'll get caught up as soon as we can. Alrighty, so yeah, this is, a, I guess, a mini follow on to, we sort of, did a video recently on uh, going long with you know immersive waxing. So if you've got ultra distance events, multi-day and so on, what's the best lubrication approach? This is kind of in that same sort of area, but a bit more specific focused on just, you know, sometimes we you know, will get inquiries with regards to my wax treatment just isn't lasting my ride or I'm planning to do this particular ride or event that's a single day event. Will my wax treatment last through that event? Um, and what do I do if it doesn't? So it's kind of a good excuse to cover off, a, I guess, uh, a couple of little ins and outs with regards to wax treatment lifespan. What are the early, warn sorry, early warning signs as to when your treatment's starting to give out? What can really impact that you know, giving out sooner or later? And some things that, you know, some options to extend may or may not be viable for you, but certainly there are cases where it's worth pondering um, because it really could make a difference for a particular event. Right now for brevity for today, for me at least anyway, sort of, as much as I do brevity, uh, we're gonna be assuming that you've got, I guess, a properly wax chain. So it's been properly prepped either by you or it's a proper pre-prep chain and it's a, it's a proven wax. Um, and having a look into the times where it may or may not be lasting uh, as long as we need it to. Um, it's a whole bunch of other clutter if I go to go into all the ins and outs that you know, may be causing poor wax bond and things like that. So just refer to things like the chain prep guide, which we have on the uh, instructions tab, 
and obviously what wax you're using and things like that. Um, yeah, if you're getting only 60 kilometers out of a wax treatment on dry road cycling, obviously something is up that's separate to what we're going to be talking about today. All right, believe it or not, today's little topic um, gives me an excuse just to go over some fun close-ups of chain parts again because it's going to explain really what's going on and why with regards to wax treatment lifespans and it, yeah it impacts with other you know wet lubricants and so on as well but in a you know can be in a different way but just knowing i guess what's happening where in your chain will give you a good understanding of what those early warning signs are um, and you know when should you be start to, to be worried and you know just some fun options to ponder um, that may help especially if it's a particularly sort of long hard climbing off-road event things like that but anyway let's have a quick run through and this will be a fun little refresher on why some drip lubricants have some trouble penetrating deep inside the chain uh, which is what we see with the initial uh, wear rates for lubricants that have initial penetration issues all right so we can see we've got a bit of a close-up of the chain um, here which was sort of part of that what we want to take note of for today is we want to be taking note of this in here between the inner and outer plate links and also between the side of the roller and the inner plate link what happens when your roller comes in contact or link you know comes in contact with your chain ring or cog the roller is actually held static there's a there's a solid pin obviously running through that's riveted to the outer plates so the outer plates obviously don't articulate or bend around that pin they are fixed so what occurs is the inner link plate is doing all the movement basically the inner link plate bore is going to articulate around the pin and the shoulders of the inner link plate uh, that the roller sits on let's see if i can get that pick up they are going to articulate inside the roller bore. Your main load surfaces when you are pedaling along are, you know, this is really where all your pedaling load is, is going through that's propelling you forward, are the inner link plate here articulating around the roller bore, and, uh, sorry, around the pin, I should say, sorry, and these inner plate link shoulders articulating inside the roller bore. They are the main load surfaces and they are the surfaces that wear the most from your pedaling load. However, there is going to be a certain amount of load that is placed on the side of the roller to the inner link plate and also the inner link plate and the outer link plate. And that is going to obviously be dependent on your chain line angle. If you're pedaling in a straight chain line, uh, the load on those surfaces is very, very low. And that load is going to increase obviously the more extreme your chain line angle becomes just while I'm on this pick here you can see between the the inner link plates that there is a tiny little gap that is actually the only way lubricant has to get through to get to and then disseminate across the surface of the pin to lubricate that main load area there there is no access to lubricate the pin through the inner and outer plate link or basically believed to be none really if we have a look at an outer uh, link plate so let me just rub some of this off now da, 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 da. so you might be able to see there there is um a give me my marker back a chamfer um on that uh on the outer link plates so that basically when you whatever lubricant gets applied that goes down in between your inner and outer link plate it's going to run around that chamfer and it's not going to get to the pin there may be some that, that sort of spills over with a bit of play but by and large there's not really any good access to the pin uh, through that point there so the the main access point to actually lubricant getting to your pin and actually lubricating a main load surface is through this very small gap and this is where some wax strips especially can come unstuck it's not all about viscosity some very thin wax strips really struggle to penetrate whereas some other heavier ones uh, do not a lot of it actually comes down to uh, the surface tension so there are things that are included in a lot of lubricants such as uh, surfactants and wetting agents which are there to really help lower 
the surface tension so that the, um, the lubricant can flow through this gap. If there's too much surface tension in the lubricant, it's pretty much going to get stuck and it's not going to get through there very well at all. Now, why did I just bang on about all of that? So when we're talking about immersive waxing, we have obviously you know, wax that's penetrated through the entire chain, bonded to the wax surfaces, uh, and we have this lovely super slippery wax coating on all those load surfaces, and things are as yee as things can be with regards to chain lubrication. Now what we can see though is that as we go you know, up to the larger cogs on the cassette, we are running you know, not a straight chain line, which would you know, be running nicely down here, but it's going on an ever-increasing angle. Now that final chain line angle is going to be determined by a few things. Your frame is one of them, but also your chain ring and cog size, because the larger diameter cog and the larger diameter ring, and I have a whole topic on this on, um, on another video, that will basically hang on to the chain for another link because of the larger diameter. Uh, so if you're running, say, a 28 tooth cog versus a 52 uh, tooth cog, that will hang on to more chain for longer uh, and give you a more extreme chain line angle and same with the chain ring size. So if someone's running say a 34 tooth or a 32 tooth uh, chain ring to a 42 tooth uh, cog at the rear, will generally have a lesser chain line angle in the largest cog than somebody running a you know 36 tooth to a 52 tooth. And that can really come into play. So ducking back to a little picture of the chain. So for an immersive wax chain, and this will, you know, by and large apply to a lot of wax strips as well, is that dust contamination especially, so this, this sort of, I guess, comes up earlier for uh, off-road cases, dust has a much harder time, sorry, much harder, much easier time getting in between the inner and outer link plates there, between that gap, and also between the um, inside of the, I guess the sides of the roller there and the inner link plate. As load is then introduced to those surfaces from a chain line angle, so when you're you know riding in your larger cogs, then you know the dust can abrade the wax off those surfaces. So how fine is the dust? How abrasive is it? What's your chain line angle? What's your pedaling load? Um, and so how much load is going through those surfaces with abrasive dust? That's all going to play a big part into how quickly the wax will be abraded off these surfaces. Um, you know, it could be 12 hours into an event. It could be half an hour into an event if it's a full wet mudder. Um, there can be some really harsh, dusty um, you know, off-road events where the, the dust is basically fine rock dust where you know literally sort of two to three hours into an xc marathon things can be getting pretty bare on these surfaces now if it's dry then the dust has a really tough time though penetrating much deeper than that uh, with an immersive wax um, you know over time obviously it can get underneath the roller and start to braid off the you know off the wax surface for the inner plate link shoulders and the uh, roller bore but then even, I guess, delayed more than that is dust trying to get through this gap to the pin. Again, it's just really, really hard for dust with a solid lubricant to get that deep into the chain and abrade the wax off the main load surface of the inner link uh, bore uh, and around the, uh, the pin surface. So what this means is you normally will get a nice early warning uh, signal. So what happens, and obviously I've been riding immersive waxing for a long, long time, and my um, sort of favorite is mountain biking, especially the longer stuff. Uh, not too long, because I'm an old, semi-old man with a bad back, but XC Marathon I'm much better at than pretty much any other type of uh, racing. So you're four hour, six hour, 12 hour, that sort of stuff. Uh, so you do get, especially if it's really dusty and abrasive dust, is that at a certain point into the event, or if it's just a long training ride and it's really dusty, the chain will start to give you some you know, sounds and signs when you're on the larger cogs and getting those higher chain line angles that the wax treatment's getting pretty done on the sides of those parts. So the chain will basically start to sound and feel obviously dry in your larger cogs. 
and yet when you sh get to sort of shift further down and into a straight chain line, it's gone back to smooth and silent again. So that's the first clue that you know stuff's getting abraded off. Same will happen with road. Um, so again, normally, if it's a, especially a climbing event for road, you're going to start to get a dry sounding and feeling chain in your climbing gears and then back to smooth again in your sort of faster road gears. Things just will tend to, I guess, happen more quickly, you know, obviously off-road with dust where uh, you get that early warning sign, you know, potentially after only an hour or two, whereas dry road, it's going to be, that's, that's, a, that's going to be a long race for that to be a problem. So, yeah, in general, it's a question that comes up a lot more for, you know, gravel and mountain bike riders, and especially in some parts of the world, say like, you know, Arizona, you know, we've certainly had feedback over the years that for some, it can be a struggle to get through their 80 to 100 kilometer long ride on the weekend out in the Arizona dust. Um, and that, I guess, the main load parts are still going fine, but the side load parts, so the side of your roller to the inner plate link, inner plate link to outer plate link, from X time into that ride, they're running without wax anymore because that's all been abraded off. What's now lubricating those parts is dust which is less optimal but the good news is deep inside things are still going really well and for road normally what it is is it's your i guess first warning sign to you know consider when it's going to re-wax so one of the questions i get i guess fairly commonly is people are looking for a fairly hard and fast rule as to how many kilometers they should uh, be able to get for re-waxing their chain and it's just not something that we can really give. We can, we do give very approximate ballparks, like we're sort of fairly conservative and say, you know, say 300 kilometers for dry road conditions. But there's variance across that with everything. Sorry, some beeps in the background. Um, at the end of the day, how much climbing do you do? So how much time are you spending in a, I guess, a higher torque gear where you're not going that far, you know, on a chain line angle? Your chain is going to start to sound and feel more dry more quickly than somebody who's belting along on the flatlands, um, you know, at 40 k's an hour in a straight chain line. Yeah, and similarly for off-road, if you're doing a lot of climbing and if it happens to be a lot of abrasive dust, you're going to get those early warning signs on your chain sounding and feeling dry in those climbing gears, you know, at a much earlier point than somebody else who's zooming along generally on hard pack on their gravel bike. So it is all highly variable. And the general rule of thumb is that you should start to get to know, you know, what is that point for you and your cycling? So if you tend to find that for your cycling, the chain starts to sand, sound and feel dry after eight hours or 10 hours, I tend to use hours. I guess it's because I'm sort of more off-road than on-road. It's, it's a, you know, off-road, you just don't go as far. You're doing more powered pedal strokes for a lot less distance, you know, when you're climbing up 15% grades and, and ramps and it's slower terrain. So hours is a more, I guess, general, better number to work with versus kilometers. Um, but you know, if you tend to find that after say eight hours for you, you're starting to get those warning signs that the chain's sounding and feeling dry. If you bring it back from that a bit, that's perfect. So it's kind of like, okay, I've done six hours and I'm planning to do a three hour ride on the weekend. Well, it's probably gonna be pretty dry for you know the, the last part of that uh, ride. Why don't I go out with a silky smooth chain for the entirety of that ride? I'll re-wax before my long ride this weekend. Getting to know that for yourself is the best way to go. Um, and it's a similar thing for, you know, indoor. I'm often asked about, you know, um, if, you know, Zwift and just indoor training, um, people will expect that it's going to be a lot longer versus outdoor because there's no contamination and so on. But again, if you're versing sort of dry road, there's not that much contamination generally out on dry road, you know, either. But some people can be using their indoor cycling in general for more high intensity sessions. So if you're smashing high intensity intervals for most of your indoor cycling, that's higher load on the chain. The higher the load, the shorter the um, lubricant treatment lifespan. And that's true for all lubricants, not just obviously waxing. Uh, and there can tend to be not many free kilometers indoors as well. If I climb at 270 watts for 45 minutes to go up our main climb here in Adelaide, after that I might have you know the next sort of 10 kilometers that are very low load as I'm zooming along going mostly downhill. Normally after, say, 270 watts for 45 minutes on an ergo, what you have to greet you after that might be another 270 watts or higher power for whatever minutes uh, you're continuing to do your ergo for. There's just not typically those sort of free kilometers afterwards. So, 
you know, it's, I guess, certainly not a given that despite the fact indoors should have no contamination, that your treatment lifespans will be longer indoors than outdoors. Right, wet conditions, especially if it's wet off-road, you know, things can, I guess, really change quite a bit. So, you know, normally in the dry, um, even if it's really quite dusty, um, and even if you get, I guess, those early warning signs relatively soon into your, you know, ride or race, you can, I guess, be safe in the knowledge that things are going to be fine on the main load surfaces for a fair bit of time you know after that starts even when that starts to get pretty bad your main penalty is going to obviously be in those climbing gears where if all you have now is dust for lubrication you maybe you had a one to two watt penalty for riding in the largest cog before due to the chain line angle that's just going to increase and when you're going into your climbing gears it could be five watts um, you know by the end of the race something like that so not optimal but you know really it won't have penetrated too much further past those parts and it won't really have abraded the wax off the main load surface areas. When it's wet, things obviously just, it's just such an extreme challenge. You've got a part working so hard, being thrown, you know, thrown water and all whatever abrasive crap that's being brought in with the water. Your chain's not waterproof, so the water is gonna bring this crap right through the chain. Still, there's gonna be less of getting deep in, you know, initially than, than uh, on the more exposed uh, parts, but it's going to get in there, um, especially if it's sort of you know wet off-road, and it's going to abrade the wax off everything. And you know after X amount of time, so how wet, how muddy, and abrasive, what you may have lubricating your chain is basically then water and mud. So you know things get can get pretty rough. So if it's wet and muddy and it's sounding horrible uh, in your climbing gears, it's unfortunately probably going to be horrible in all of your gears you're running on mostly water and mud and again so this is really where it's going to come down to like how long is the event you know and when did this start happening into the event and should you take some intervention in general in such conditions uh, especially if it's long some intervention is going to be warranted if it's an hour and a half xc race and your chain sounds and feels horrible after 45 minutes then you just push on. It's an XC race. You've just got to get to the end. You're not going to stop and relube your chain. If it's a four-hour XC marathon race, it may well be worth it because do you really want to ride for sort of you know three hours with potentially around a 15 watt loss chain? And obviously, if it's a really long uh, particular um, event, like a obviously an unbound, or uh, I had a question recently about uh, one with a lot of climbing that's 177 kilometers long you know absolutely you're going to want to jump off and throw on some uh, wet lube um, as we covered in the going long it really needs to be a wet lube uh, if you're doing a top up during such events because wax drips um, unless they are set uh, if it is wet they would pretty much just be washed out because they will more or less have water as their carrier anyway so wax drip lubricants do need their set time they'll go okay if it's dry like if it's a long dry event and it's given out um, you know it's really not pleasurable to ride in most gears uh, sure you can add a wet uh, wax drip but just bear in mind obviously being wet it's going to attack, attract contamination anyway similar to a wet lube and it's just really not going to have the staying power of a wet lubricant um, you know whilst it, it hasn't set so the general recommendation is for you know most events and so on to to jump to that um, so yeah Things to consider that may help things um, if you're faced with a really long, harsh challenge. All right, so number one, obviously, is just be prepared. Um, it is generally better to, I guess, have been prepared to top up with a top wet lubricant um, than, you know, not have thought of that and be caught out. The old saying of, I guess, it's really better to. I guess have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Uh, events where your lubrication is given out and you go for hours with a horrible sounding and feeling chain that's just eating up what's eating through your chain, that is not pleasurable and you know not great for obviously uh, the wear of your potentially expensive stuff. So if in doubt, just, just pack it um, and 
things like Synergetic, um, it's a pretty small bottle and you can also obviously uh, get little other bottles and transfer some into that just if you need to do an emergency top up and it's it's bugger all weight and size to have to uh, to pack. So yeah, just have a ponder. Uh, the other part I guess is, you know, if you are across what's happening and you know the warning signs because you've been sort of, I guess, getting to know that in your own training, you know whether or not you know better if you need to take some action or if things are all cool it's just getting a bit dry and you know a bit not optimal on those particular gears not too much far to go not too much more climbing to go you know we're able to push on you can make better judgment decisions um, on your long rides events and races if you understand what's happening and you've got to know the warning signs um, you know you just know what to do when much better and I guess really lastly, and this one's not going to be, I don't think, applicable to too many, but it, I guess for those it is applicable for, it can really help. Basically, consider if you've got really a lot of climbing um, in your event and it's going to be a struggle, especially if it's going to be wet, you do want to try to minimize that chain line angle. So... There are general hints and tips and hacks. I'm not going to bother with pictures because I'm going to run, run long. But sometimes drive lines or drive train lines can be improved quite a bit by even just millimeters at uh, the crank end and at the cassette end. So sometimes just say can be removing a spacer on the crank or a wave washer if you're able to get away with that. Check your Q factor, which is basically the obviously the stance. You want the stance to your pedals to be equal both sides. You may need to use a pedal washer to space a, uh, the drive side pedal back out if you've moved it in a, mil a millimeter or two. Uh, but sometimes literally just moving your chain ring inboard a millimeter or two and if you have the room, being able to move your cassette outboard with cassette shims a millimeter or two, you'd be amazed how much difference that can make, especially if things are getting, I guess, at the more extreme chain line angles. Sometimes people will push their chain line angles a bit with their chain ring sizes and cog range. Um, and I mean, all chains, like derailleur chains, have a certain amount of lateral flexibility. Within that lateral flex, the loads on those parts stay pretty low. So I guess the amount of, you know, sort of abrasion and wear of the wax treatment off the sides of those parts is obviously lower. Once you start to hit the, I guess, the lateral flex limit of a chain and push past that, you really do start to load up those parts quite heavily. And this is where your losses for chain line angles can really ramp up, especially if you've got no lubricant left in there. Um, you know, sometimes some people can have you know, instances where, you know, on the largest cog that, yeah, that I guess the pressure on the sides of those parts is it's trying to pull the chain off the chain ring. And that can happen sometimes over bumps or you know, just even, even randomly every now and then a chain might get pulled down off the chain ring. So there are certain, I guess, tipping points where if you exceed that lateral flex, things can get pretty bad. And things can be really improved by um, sometimes dropping to a smaller ring. So whilst in general, running the largest chain ring and thereby the largest cog uh, for a given gear inches gives you maximum efficiency, there are times where due to chain line angle, uh, that may not be the case. And so especially if a drop in chain ring size enables you to, I guess, move one cog further across at the back so that you're potentially running a lot of the time in the second largest cog, not the largest cog. And then a whole lot of other times you're running in the third or the fourth cog as opposed to the second and the third cog. It's taking the load off the sides of those parts, which at the end of the day, any load on the sides of those parts is it's just straight up loss. It's not transferring into propelling you forwards further. So depending on the event, you know, at the end of the day, if you can spend, say, an hour less in your largest cog, you know, that can really tip things back in the favor of the small ring being more efficient overall uh, due to less losses from the chain line angle, especially when you may have then run the lubricant treatment out on those parts. Um, as opposed to the normal wisdom where the larger the ring and therefore the larger the cog for any given gear inches is going to be your most efficient. This can be a pain in the ass. So not only obviously do you have to, I guess, have a different size ring, 
it's going to need a shorter chain and that shorter chain then won't run uh, when you go back to your normal size ring so it can be quite event specific but for sure there are events you know heavy climbing events like say um, lead boat things like that um, where for some cyclists dropping down a chain ring size being able to spend less time in the largest cog and at extreme chain line angles that that can be a net benefit overall versus pushing that chain ring size and spending just ages grinding away in that largest cog at the worst chain line angle that you that you have so just to try to wrap that because i've again, been a rambling mess today with out any time to retake um yeah, it's, it's a bit of a double so you know there's the one part where reducing the load on the sides of those parts uh, does reduce the losses for the chain line angle but the big one in terms of i guess what we're focused on here with regards to the treatment lifespan for some of these long um, days long events is that by reducing the load on those uh, the sides of those parts you are greatly extending the time for which you are still going to have wax on the sides of those parts lubricating them um, so you will greatly extend how deep into your ride or event you're going to get that really dry feeling dry sounding chain in your climbing gears because quite simply you've taken the load off um, you know that those parts by quite a bit so you're not abrading through the treatment as quickly uh, so it's one of these things where you know again depending on your general riding depending on what the the event race is like if you really need the zooming along gear because there's a lot of fast sections you know dropping a chain ring size maybe it's just not going to work out better overall but again it's best to focus on these things by time because um quite often people can look at say x number of kilometers that they have where they're going to be expecting to be zooming along and there's a smaller number of kilometers that are climbing but the total time spent climbing might be 50 percent or 100 percent greater than the time spent zooming along so if you're spending you know the bulk of your time in a more efficient um, cycling manner uh, by going to a smaller ring and therefore a lesser chain line angle the benefits of that could quite well outweigh whatever small losses you may have uh, in the zoom along sections so just things to ponder uh, for both either events or your own uh, you know, long riding where you might be finding that its uh, treatments might be giving out if it's really dusty and harsh now, the last time a bit so it may sound like um you know wet lubricants which will tend to not necessarily sound and feel really dry at certain points in some events and that can be the case especially for some long lasting wet lubricants uh, you you might not get a dry sounding and feeling uh, chain two hours or four hours or six hours into a particular ride or event like you may get with a, a wax or immersive wax but just remember the trade-off to that can be that whilst I guess you have something there that's uh, acting as a lubricant, what's there can be really abrasive. So um, obviously the wet lubricants are going to gather dust from kilometer zero and start to become more and more abrasive. So you know after an hour, they're going to be quite abrasive, whereas your wax is going to not be. After two hours, they can be more abrasive and your wax treatment might be holding up just fine and, and uh, things are going really all groovy you've got a solid lubricant there which is the highest dust and contamination resistant uh, possible so it can be a little bit of a false feeling where um, you know things may feel smooth to you through your pedals but what's really going on can be akin to a grinding paste uh, you know happening you know sort of masquerading as your lubricant uh, again, there can be times where you know the crossover point can tip in favour of wet lubricants because obviously a wet lubricant uh, masquerading as a bit of a grinding paste can still be better than say zero lubricant and just dust in there. But for the time where the immersive wax or a top wax strip is uh, you know hanging in there, things are going to be much better. So it's it's as with everything, it's a way up and a balance. But generally speaking. Your fastest, lowest friction, lowest wear option for most of these events uh, is going to be immersive wax. If it doesn't last uh, and things are starting to sound and feel bad, top up then with a wet lubricant and things will be golden to get you to the end. Right, so hopefully that sort of made sense. Uh, yeah, again, sorry, uh, rushed wording again today. But uh, if it was all really terrible and didn't make sense, I'll have another crack at this when I get back from, uh, from holidays. But with luck, um, that will give, a, I guess, a bit of an understanding with regards to 
you know, really why, why sometimes immersive wax chains might start to sound and feel dry uh, on especially your longer rides. What's causing that? How bad is that? Um, and yeah, obviously there is a, you know, some wear associated with that that's not elongation wear. So we tend to talk about, uh, I guess, chain wear as elongation wear because that's the real killer in terms of what will eat out your chain ring and cassette and cost you lots of money. So staying on top of your chain's elongation wear and replacing by 0.5% wear mark, you know, with an accurate uh, chain check tool, that is your best friend for saving lots of money over time in cycling. Um, we don't tend to talk a lot about lateral wear. Um, it's generally not a big thing that comes up. Like it can, but it's um, it's not, I guess, a common, I guess, problem that arises uh, these days. So if you know, for most cyclists, in most cases, if they are replacing their chain by 0.5% wear, the amount of lateral wear between the sides of the rollers and the inner link plate and the inner and outer link plate, which basically means then your chain becomes more laterally flexible, um, it's not really worn to an issue of concern um, by that time. It can start to become a concern when people are pushing their elongation wear to you know 1%, 1.52%, when the lateral wear of your chain gets quite bad, it really can start to negatively affect, affect the shifting. It's just you've got a really sloppy chain. So um, if you're riding a lot of the time on a you know, really quite high chain line angle with a lot of dust getting in there and you're always coming up to a point where, you know, or you're riding a number of hours all the time where your chain is sounding and feeling dry in your climbing gears, you can be a case where lateral wear of the chain can start to impact the shifting performance of that chain before you reach the 0.5% elongation wear mark. However, that's rare. And again, once you get to know, you know, understanding what's going on with your immersive wax treatment, recognizing when it's sounding and feeling dry for you, and in general, re-waxing a bit before it tends to get to that point for your amount of sort of cycling hours, that's just a great way to you know, I guess tackle your immersive waxing and or topping up with wax strips in between immersive waxing so that it's not getting to that point. So if it, you know, if in doubt after one ride, top up with your wax strip lube, allow the overnight set so that for your next ride, it's all sweet. And you re-lube the next three to five times if you're doing that sort of hybrid or combo approach to keep your chain running absolutely silky smooth. And then you do your immersive re-wax and you've stayed on top of your lubrication, uh, sorry, lubricant life, lifespan treatments and everything is just going silky smooth and golden all the time. So just having that basic understanding hopefully will help. And let's hope this uh, last 30 minutes of rambling made some sense. All right, last quick bit today. No, it's gone a bit long as always, but um, I wanted to start trying to introduce uh, a section each week of basically, because we obviously get a lot of inquiries in each week. So I might try to pick one of those as, I guess, the question of the week to run through and we'll just you know, keep help building the, the general knowledge about there of all things waxing and lubrication. And this one, let's have a look. Uh, it's, it's one from a yeah, long time great uh, commenter and follower of uh, ZFC. Often comes in with a lot of excellent information in the comments. Right, this question does keep coming up a bit um, and it's come up more after the uh, most recent uh, wax FAQ uh, from Silka. They uh, put out another really groovy video that you know just from the questions they get re-waxing. So Adam, in the ZSC waxing guide, um, sort of how accurate do we need to be with the wax temp? So in my guide, I state anywhere between 70 and 100 degrees C will create a perfectly fine waxing. However, I've got to put put this point to Silka and GCN Tech as they keep mentioning wax skinning or close to it the temperature for pulling out the chains or basically what that means is the temperature at which, which the wax is cooled to the point where it's starting to form a skin on top although i never get a comeback silka have just put out uh, this video this implies that the 90 degrees c you usually use is too hot i wonder if silka's secret hot melt wax likes to exit chains more so than other brands uh, so 90 degrees c seems to work fine for me but i'm not using silka's wax so do we play it safe and use a wax temperature of say 75 degrees C or 90 degrees C? So in short, basically uh, on the latest Silky vid, they're sort of, I guess, recommending a lower wax um, temperature to remove your chain or wax your chain at. So they're recommending 75 degrees Celsius normally as opposed to 
Uh, I think Molten Speed Wax, sort of their textbook temp is about 90, and I say anywhere from 70 to 90, uh, sorry, 70 to 100. Uh, I think GCN Tech have mentioned a number of times that you know it's best to remove the chain from where the wax has cooled right down to where it is starting to form a skin on top. So that's for, depending on the wax, so somewhere around about 60, 65 degrees Celsius. Um, now, yeah, in general, I think I mentioned before, myself and Silker are usually fairly aligned with wax stuff, but this one we are still a little bit different. Um, from the, I guess, the official ZFC line, or my recommendation is that you know the pressures inside the chain when you're cycling along are uh, they just really really high where you know it's hundreds to thousands of psi so when you take your freshly waxed chain and start riding it after the initial break in where you get the excess wax that's pressed out and then the wax that's coating the parts inside the chain will start to polish up after 10 to 15 minutes of cycling you will have a really thin layer of wax coating all the parts that need to be coated inside the chain now, if you remove the chain from your wax at 100 degrees Celsius and hang it to set on a 40 degrees Celsius day, yes, more wax is going to drip out of the chain whilst it's hot and staying hot for a long time. You are still going to have a absolutely perfectly, um, I guess, the right amount of wax inside your chain where you need it to form that lovely coating and you will get you know, the same treatment lifespan and, and performance and everything. If you remove the chain from wax that's cooler than that, so let's say you remove it at 75 or where it's just starting to skin over at 60 or 65, basically after 10 to 15 minutes of cycling, you're in the same spot, re the wax layer inside your chain, uh, as you would as if you had removed it at the 100 degrees Celsius and hang it at 40 degrees uh, to set. Um, all that you have, I guess, from the latter is a lot more excess wax that's pressed out and also the excess wax on the outside of the chain that's going to flake off. So you're just kind of taking more wax out of the pot and creating a bigger mess. So really, if you're slow cooker or crock pot, if it gets the, the chain wax between 70 and 100, that's basically perfect. Anywhere in that range, you're going to get a perfectly fine re-wax and after 10 to 15 minutes of cycling, the wax layer inside your chain coating all your parts, you're going to be all in the same place. So I've tended to always just recommend that pretty big broad window. Um, much above 100, you, you are starting to, you know, for some waxes potentially reach the, you know, an unhappy temperature where you might start to break down uh, the, you know, the wax molecules and impact its lubricity. But 70 to 100 is a pretty big target to hit. So you have never been on board, and this is something I had discussed a long time ago with Jason Smith uh, right back in the Friction Facts days, and he was of the exact same opinion, and from his testing, uh, it's, it's kind of like, in terms of wax treatment longevity, maybe you get another 10 minutes because it's taking just a little bit longer to get all that excess out, but it's, it's not really a great extra 10 minutes of, uh, of, of you know, treatment lifespan you're getting from the hassle of standing by your pot and waiting for it to cool, uh, such that the wax starts to skin over and then remove it and then have to deal with all the excess wax and all the excess amount of wax you're taking out of your pot, which is less re-wax as you get for your you know, bag of wax and so on. It's just not, I guess, the path we recommend to specifically look to remove your chain from wax that's cooler. If it's 70 to 100 for MSW, for hot melt, for Rex, perfect. All right, that'll do. Thank you for bearing with me again. Um, I can't promise I'm going to get to a video each week before the holidays because I, I really am behind and I really am getting uh, super rushed. So I s apologies again, I didn't have any time to retake terribly worded um, video clips. Uh, it's going to be a, a case of if I do, we'll all have to just put up with me as I am for the moment and then post holidays once I've caught up, that will be when I can hopefully commit to actually improving on my uh, wording on my clips by taking some time to A, script if I need to for some things or B, if I just make a rambling mess of it, take the time to reshoot it and have another crack. So. If you have put up with me so far, thank you for that, and I'll try not to be too maddeningly uh, terrible um, in the lead up to the holidays. But it may also be, uh, I may not have time in the upcoming weeks to get a video out each week, um, but we'll see. I'll either rush through something and hope it's not too painful, um, and hopefully still 
uh, of good information value um, all up. But if it's going to be really bad or really too rushed, then I uh, I may just uh, yeah things will be a bit sporadic between now and when I'm back from leave. Other than that, super exciting weekend. We have Formula One in Suzuka and also obviously Paris Roubaix, which is going to be mega. Um, oh, so wish there was a way that they could actually properly sort of track life for us the number of uh, punches and broken wheels and things like that, as well as the main racing action. Obviously, I love the tech side around all this, and I can't wait to see uh, Ronan McLaughlin's uh, coverage of the tech side of the Paris Bay uh, on Escape Collective. So, yeah, it's all going to be pretty awesome. All right, I'll hopefully be back next week. Otherwise, have a great weekend of cycling and a great week, and I'll catch you on the next one.